Trade PMR offers to support the growth that RAAs deserve. Whether you're looking to add an additional custodial services provider or make the switch to a new one, Trade PMR offers advisors access to dedicated team members. So when you need help, you know exactly who to call. Trade PMR, member of FINRA and SIPC. Welcome to the WellStack Podcast. I'm your host, Shannon Rosick, the Director of WellStack Content Solutions. In this episode, I'm joined by Nick Graham, Executive Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at Cambridge. And everyone knows how much I love talking to CTOs. And today's topic, <laughs> we're actually getting into the mind of a CTO and talking about everything from AI to what's keeping these technologists up at night. Nick, just thrilled to be speaking with you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. No, my pleasure. I'm glad we have a chance to talk about a very actively, you know, announced focus in the industry right now around AI and how we might use it. And it's definitely something that is in my forefront right now as we try to adopt it and do more with it. So. Absolutely. And before we dive into the meat of all of this, you know, I want folks just to get to know you a little bit better. So let's start with your background, what makes you you and how you landed where you are today. Okay. Uh, the the fast background for me is I'm a, a long-term CTO, a lot of different industries. I've done a lot of things for the military, did a lot of things for the early dot-com and data center you know, range, did a lot of retail and a lot of wholesale, and got into fintech about 20 years ago and have enjoyed the challenge of business issues being solved by technical challenges and have kind of made that my brand. Um, was approached by others to join the Cambridge story about six years ago and have moved out to the Iowa area where our headquarters is located, uh, sold the home in Denver, and have never looked back and have really enjoyed the transition. Oh, well, I'm sorry I missed you out here in Denver. I moved out here in 2017, <laughs> so we just crossed paths then. <laughs> so you mentioned you know, you've been doing this in the fintech space for for over 20 years now. You know, obviously fintech alone moves so quickly. Over the last 20 years, what has been the biggest change or shift that you've seen in that space? What has you excited? Besides AI. The, <laughs> besides AI. I, I would say the the biggest shift that I've seen over that whole scope of time has been a lot of the offerings and a lot of the traditional engagement with technology were in-house systems, you know, closed perimeters. It's what that shop or firm could offer. You had to be a part of their ecosystem to enjoy it. And there was very little integration across the entire offering space that was out there. As things became more interested in internet access, the demographic of the end client you know, started to have new demands. You started to see that become more permeable. Uh, you started having more integrations with your banking relationships. You started having more youthful expectations of my devices should give me access to all of my data at any time, anywhere. Um, and as systems tried to respond to that, leaders started to present themselves. They started to do things in new ways. They started to present integration opportunities in new ways. And that became exciting because now you had a lot of feature point opportunities to say, something like a good proposal system or a good profile of my investments or a good relationship to all of my family and household information would be much more of a rich opportunity for the advisor or the investment you know, manager to interact with me as a client. And so new tech started to generate itself uh, in that, that space of new demand and it's accelerating. I mean, you see a lot more of that. You see a lot of the providers chasing the idea that their full stack offering now needs to be something that's more uh, available for integration or more accessible to people that want to take it in piecemeal form. And that provides a lot of new investment in the technology, which excites me because it's solving the business problems in new ways. So one of the questions I get a lot too is, does integration always have to stink? Like, where are we in, <laughs> in this space right now? It's it's a it's a it's a challenge that comes up, especially over the last few years. Especially, we have over what four hundred applications now in the wealth tech space yes. alone. So, obviously, integration is a challenge. But why the heck haven't we figured out a good way to do this? Well, there's a couple things that I think happen there. Uh, one. With every new opportunity to tie things together, you have security risks. So security, you know, clouds a lot of what people are capable of doing or how they do it or the risk of doing it. So that changes the nature of what you can actually integrate. I'll let you have this kind of data, but not the full features. You'll have some limitation or constraint. 
uh, or the product itself may be very targeted to, you know, we want to do one thing very well, and we're not going to try to be all things to all people. So you end up with different levels of complexity or um, feature value that might be integrated together. And so you have simple trying to be integrated in with complex, uh, either in data or activity. And I think that engineering challenge for propeller heads with a tie like me, um, you know, become very interesting as to who solves it and wins in their space. Um, and as we try to make those decisions moving forward, integrations have now started to take on the discipline of systems engineering. Build frameworks with the idea that change is inevitable. Build system dependencies with the idea that they're abstracted enough to allow for them to be replaced by the next you know, wave of interesting offerings by a new player. Uh, or that maybe a player drops out of the picture and you still are able to survive, you know, that impact to your system of use and integration. It's very important for that because I think as people want to have their own choice and their own flexibility of adoption, people that do that well become very attractive to them. So you're going to attract, you know, the move in the market. People that build, you know, isolated islands of capability you can do the classic IT game and and build that to be very efficient and highly tuned and have margins that are razor thin, uh, but your ability to adapt and move is challenged then by your dependencies that you've built into that. Cambridge, for example, one of the reasons why I was attracted to this, our whole value proposition is about flexibility. And so building with that in mind, building and partnering with the players that we offer to our advisors are very broad. I mean, we don't have a fixed technology stack here. We have a variety of players that offer things. And I build for that in terms of the way we approach our technology offerings. And that allows for us to be very flexible. It's more expensive. Uh, there is a challenge of complexity, but we're much more responsive and we're much more open to the idea of, is this what you need to do your business, you know, Mr. Financial Professional, then we have a way we can probably solve for you. And being able to say yes is a key part of what makes us unique. And uh, I think that's the way of improving integrations in the industry. Systems engineering principles allowing for change and building good frameworks are very, very key. And there's actually cottage industries that are coming up in this market now where people play the role of that universal business adapter. You know, they're, they don't want to do anything other than do the mapping from system A to system B. Um, and, you know, they play strong roles in making that possible. And we're moving away from the idea that you have a classic high integration, unique offering just for you as a firm, because those are not very easily maintained and probably more expensive than you would probably imagine to own. And having different ways to perform the activity uh, and achieve better integration that have a long-term investment value are the way people are talking and doing it nowadays. That's new, probably in the last five years in this industry, in my opinion. Well, I appreciate you putting a positive spin on it from a Cambridge standpoint. It's good to hear flexibility. Yes. And you're putting in the time, money and effort oh, to, yes. to do it right. So appreciate the background and the context. So uh, Nick, at this time though, we're going to dive into our first segment that I okay. affectionately call stats all folks. So we obviously, as we mentioned, we have to talk about the biggest trend that has been dominating headlines, mm -hmm. even though the concept isn't new, AI continued to be just the hottest topic of 2023. And the explosive growth of AI, you know, this past year seems to really be driven by a convergence of factors like, like the, the availability of massive, massive amounts of data, the rise mm -hmm. in machine learning, you know, the convergence of AI with other technologies such as blockchain and quantum computing. We can go on and on. And in fact, our own Wellstack study that we produced this past year, over the next five years, 82% of respondents said that AI will be the technology trend with the biggest impact on wealth management. You know, what's your stance on AI and what's driving this growth and adoption right now? I'm really excited about it. Again, you know, an area of personal interest of mine is improving the data story in this industry. And almost every version of AI, and there's many different disciplines, you know, if you look at a four-year school type program, there's roughly 16 different disciplines you can have for AI methodology or degrees of focus. Uh, so the chat GPT is just one subset of one of those 16, as an example. But they all require good data, or they all require data of a rich nature to perform the kind of activity that 
we want it to help us with. And I'm excited about it. I mean, it does help the mundane challenges of task and activity. It does things better than us in a lot of historical and pattern matching things of look at 10 years worth of data and give me a pattern that's going to be meaningful to me kind of examples. Um, that excites me. Uh, but the data issue is very key to that. And also the way that you maintain it. Uh, you know, some of these systems, you just don't plug them in and they just automatically deliver value. You actually have to invest in their training. You have to structure a method of owning it and you have to ensure that it's going to not do things that are unexpected or not appropriate for our industry. There's a, there's obviously a lot of interest from the compliance community about how are you using it? In what way does it do a job that we'd otherwise hold you accountable for? And you'll probably see a lot of pressure starting to present itself from the regulatory side of things uh, as we move forward. But I'm excited about it enriching what the advisors can do for our clients, showing activity to be done in a more efficient model. And that allows a lot of the firms that are under this new tech pressure to scale. To, to not have to, you know, be technology firms, but rather find a way to leverage technology for how their firm needs to operate for their clients. You know, that is a key distinction in the industry, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. And as a content producer, I want to touch on generative AI briefly, mm -hmm. because according to the McKinsey Global Institute, generative AI could add the equivalent from anywhere from 2.6 trillion to 4.4 trillion annually in value. Uh, and the wealth management sector specifically could see about 45 billion of that because what makes it unique is, is it its ability to obviously generate content, which is a differentiator from other AI technology. And it's one thing for technology to analyze large sets of content and data, but it's another thing for it to be able to generate new content based on the data that it has. So that really excites me. Where do you see that going? What's the Front, next frontier there? And, and is Cambridge utilizing anything in the Gen AI uh, landscape right now? So it definitely is exciting from the content generation standpoint. I mean, that technology is basically allowing you to simplify some complex information in a, in a written and readable and interactable, you know, format. That is exciting when you don't have to do all of that heavy lifting and do the editing and cycling of that. We're definitely using it here to help us generate, you know, some of our content, or we would be using it to help us with grooming messaging. You know, sometimes, you know, even in the art side of things, as we look at the way you might do graphics or what you might do with imagery, it allows you to have something that gets the juices flowing, if you will, on the creative front. Like, here's a good way to say this message. Here's a good way to structure it. But we still, and this has always been our you know, primary focus here, the human has to be involved. Uh, you have to have a way to, to be able to monitor its output. You can't just do a look away delivery of value here with these technologies yet. So, you know, our ability to leverage them aids the user. It, it excites and simplifies and makes more efficient the actual delivery of content creation. Uh, but it's not left to its own devices, nor do we whole cloth, you know, turn over certain activities to them. We've kind of taken more of a an approach of supporting the associate or supporting the advisor point of view. I mean, many of the things that I might give you specific examples of would all fall into that category of thought. You know, let's make the person on the phone better for that advisor calling with a question. Let's help the advisor interacting with our resources, find something better, faster, and explain it in a different way that's very efficient. A lot of that employs AI. And that's something that we're hoping to find quicker answers and faster actions and more meaningful delivery of content so that we're not doing this in such a laborious and manual and heavy manner. Uh, and that's our our current adoption approach. But we're tracking the other technologies. I would I would say as a as a technologist looking at this, you are most likely to see a layering of AI to produce the better outcomes. You know, certain things that control and set framework for responses and actions and activity. That's one form of AI. You layer in something like generative AI. Now you have a way for it to dialogue with the user. You have a way for you to articulate business interest in a large data set. Hey, go look at all this stuff and tell me something meaningful out of it. It can go do those things and layering of different AI technologies is very key. Last comment I'll give you is, in a, is a long winded answer, sorry, um, is on the security issues. You have new developments right now on generative AI 
being able to augment the capability, the large language model that you hear about all the time, the open AI uh, and other competitors that are, are now rushing into that space. You have other players that allow you allows you to use your own internal data set my documents, our policies, what we would say are our standards, and use it as a way to frame the kind of answers that it will provide in a dialogue with an end user. And that is held on our premises, meets all of our compliance need, and controls some of the risks of someone getting access to data or information about your clients or your business that you know open systems right now would be a, a risk and threat vector for the new offerings are much more controlled and solved for that problem. So I'm excited to see that starting to be addressed right now. So not to put words in your mouth though, but yeah. it sounds like you think AI will positively impact our industry. Absolutely. And yeah. would love your opinion too. You know, at the end of the day, as you mentioned, it's a relationship-based business, very human. And so do you think technology like AI will in fact make advice more human? I think so because- there's an opportunity and definitely something that technology supports around personalization because it can be held accountable to the context of, you know, you meeting Nick Graham and you know my background and my investment history and you know the last couple of engagements that we've had together. And that information can be key to the kind of content that's created for you to engage me. It could be controlling, you know, some of the information I'm presented as the end user it could allow for a pattern of strategies that work with me best as a client and that could aid you as my advisor. You know, these are things that help an advisor that's trying to be unique, but very real and very customized to what they are in a relationship with a multitude of clients, right? It's, you know, how do they do that with, you know, a hundred or a thousand different Nick Grams? And being able to do personalization, to be able to account for history, to be able to transverse the, the activities of, of many years of, of relationship and apply it to the moment now, that is very helpful to the advisor and very helpful to the continuity of, of what you want to see in financial advice delivery or management of investment, in my opinion. On behalf of wealthmanagement.com, we invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th of Hollywood, Florida, for Wealthstack, part of Wealth Management Edge, our agenda is designed to power a new generation of growth-oriented advisors with the latest innovations and trends in technology strategies. From captivating keynote speakers to interactive workshops, dedicated think tanks, a dynamic exhibit hall, and hands-on demonstrations of cutting-edge technologies, you'll leave with a deep understanding of how to accelerate growth at your practice. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% off your registration. Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. And you mentioned that Cambridge's approach to technology is very flexible. And, you know, you're ultimately making decisions for hundreds of advisors on the technology they should be using. So I have to ask, how do these decisions help advisors truly remain independent? Because I know that's a big core value for Cambridge. And what are advisors asking for right now in terms of technology? Is any Are they clamoring for anything in specific or are they really looking for you to help help drive their those initiatives <laughs> that's a big question there's there's lots <laughs> of things they'd like to have especially the community of independence we we cater to uh, and i i enjoy it because i think the scenarios that they are servicing what makes them unique in their their area of expertise and their kind of community of investment that they operate in are all very different uh, but when you keep it to our topic today around ai they're looking for things, as you said at the opening, to develop good content for them, to help them simplify a lot of complexity in either previous documents or history or information that they're trying to simplify for an initiative they have with a client on the phone. And depending on what they're doing, you know, if they're some high net worth advisor or they're a classic, you know, retirement shop, or they're looking at some of the other scenarios of need based on who they are as an independent you know, investor providing advice, AI gives them tools for that. You know, give me something that will explain this to me. Give me something that will help me write this for this kind of a client. Give me something that will guide me through, you know, a complexity of situations to be compliant. You know, advice delivery, summarization, content development. These were all areas that a lot of requests could fall into if you had to categorize them. And you see a lot of products starting to offer that or to at least 
pronounce some capability on those fronts from my experience. And I can imagine as a CTO, no two days are ever the same on a a (laughs) day-to-day basis. So I have to ask, what's keeping you up at night right now? Is it cybersecurity risk? Is it staying on top of innovation, training employees around best practices, issues around security? What is it? All of the above? (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say, you know, they all they all play into the fabric of things that are in my head. But I would say, you know, the most current one that for me is around security. Probably second to that is around my my favorite focus on data, uh, which also involves security because there's new methods that are being offered or needed to share data. Uh, And when you do that, you open up new risks for do we understand all the ways that that might be compromised? Do we understand all the nature of what might be uh, unplanned and unnoticed exposure? And I think as you look at some of the technology interests and this pace and the speed that these things are moving on, especially in the AI space, you know, people are trying lots of proof of concepts, but the kind of data they're throwing around potentially you know, could be viewed as PII, or it could be enough to ascertain the ability to, you know, be better at phishing you, you know, the the classic approach of most humans are the biggest threat vector for security in our industry, because we're geared to try to be helpful and to provide service. You know, if I know a lot about you, and I'm able to talk informatively about a lot of stuff you've just recently done, and then I could mimic you with an AI tool, I might be able to compromise someone because I can fake being you very effectively. You know, so things like that scare me. Things like that, I actually, unfortunately, hear a lot of examples of from my security team. Uh, We invest a lot there. We track a lot there. And there's a lot of you know, slow your roll kind of guidance. Sometimes I have to give a route. Let's just not chase that, you know, bright, shiny light too fast until we know how we can protect ourselves or train ourselves or engage effectively to not be at risk. And that's often where I give advice to the advisors. Some of them in our flexible world can do a lot of things on their own, as long as they meet our policies and some guidance that we provide them. But they do come to us and say, hey, I'm going to try this. Is this okay? You know, and if I do it, what should I worry about? So that educational component in this industry about this topic is one that I I think is underserved right now. We need more ways to train advisors about what they do with these technologies and what they really mean. Because unfortunately, TikTok and YouTube have been the the vast majority of, of thoughtful insight as to how to apply them. And really, they they send the wrong message and they don't educate effectively about what really is required to do it well. Uh, or in what ways to be safe with it when you use it. Um, And that that worries me uh, a lot. And uh, frequently I find that they are surprised when they learn some of the underpinnings of the current offerings and what kind of risks they may have taken. And that is, uh, you know, where we add value. You know, we're trying to give good advice and provide good service. And that, that helps me feel a little better when the day ends. But I definitely wake up in the middle of the night thinking about, you know, the security risks and the data challenges that this particular topic drives in our industry. To me, it sounds like you should be starting a TikTok then to explain <laughs> those challenges. <laughs> you have my vote. I will absolutely be your first subscriber if you were to do that. But it, it is a challenge and, and it it makes my stomach sink half the time. I hear that the cybersecurity adoption is still just so woefully low in our industry. And to me, that just blows my mind because it should be a top priority at, at every firm. Yet again, adoption low. <laughs> Don't well, understand I- it. Well, I think it goes, and I struggle with it too, about what more you can do. I mean, we spend you know, and invest wildly in, in security, but if you go look at what really happens to the advisors and happens to their clients, it's usually a human involved, you know, and in almost all cases, it's our blind faith, if not, you know, current adoption of technology of something in this thing will take care of me. You know, and not knowing that there are opportunities for it to be compromised by a by a threat actor, you know, someone who's, you know, got ill intent. And as you engage in using technology in a business world or you throw around critical data about yourself, your identity or your assets, people want it and they work actively to get it. And the easiest way to do that is by compromising the human that's in between you and that information. And that, that is every time I go to one of these conferences and we spend money on security, you hear a lot about how the humans get compromised. 
And unfortunately, again, that's an educational issue. It's a culture issue. You know, I thought I saw something weird a month ago, but I didn't really want to tell anybody. I was like, so you let a potential compromise sit for a month. Like, okay, some very industrious, you know, bad guys probably doing a lot in a month. Uh, or, hey, I I didn't think, you know, handling my information this way just to try something was a bad thing. Well, hey, it's in the internet now. There's, as we have all learned, you know, what you've done out there is cannot unring that bell, right? It, you know, that information's out there, someone's got it, or you should assume that compromised occurred. And now you have to take proactive steps. It's, it's a, it's a downer. You know, it definitely takes the spin off of how this could be fun, but it is definitely something that I think culture and education could solve. I, I frequently give the advice at the end of a lecture or people asking me a lot of pointy questions of, have you really sat down and just played the game in your firm or you as an individual advisor and do the tabletop exercise? Did something bad happen today? Just say yes today and see what you would really go do. Who would you call? What would you gather? How would you treat something? How would you find out? How would you recover? Those things would probably wake you up, if not bring your attention to what you needed to do to be better prepared when it really does happen. And right now we've gone from stats I've recently seen from being outside the top five industries that are targeted to we're in the top two. And it's been like that for the last three years running. So everyone knows what we're doing. They know the kind of data we manage. They know the kind of assets and monetary values that are out there. And there's a reason for them to put us as a priority in their their daily work, trying to be a criminal. Um, and we need to take that seriously. Well, now that we've sufficiently scared all of our listeners. <laughs> Not intended. <laughs> it's no, a wake-up no. call moment. But like you said, there there at least is a, is a path to redemption a little bit in terms yes. of just education and training. So that's that's certainly hopeful. And on a bit of a lighter note, though, I would like to move into segment two of this episode, Nick, which is ask us anything. And I have gone out to the social universe and asked them to submit questions that they want answered by you. Okay. So I took a look to see who was sliding into the DMs this week. And we have a couple of good questions. First one being around the role of the CTO. It's obviously changing rapidly. What has evolved over the years and what are your top challenges today? Um, maybe outside of cybersecurity, since we just addressed that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say from a Cambridge perspective, the role that I have here, um, we're always innovating and we're growing, you know, so as you get to different size and scale, you start having new operational infrastructure and growth challenges. Uh, so my role in many ways becomes the orchestrator of how these things come together or to remember all the other pieces that are on the board, if you will, for how we're changing the game for the company. So it's having that holistic view and still being uh, responsible for the mandate of having it all continue to work. You know, so I, I leverage my smart people that work for me. I, I learn from them. I've empowered them. I have good partners. Uh, my president, Colleen Bell, who's part of, you know, her new title of innovation and uh, finding ways for us to work together to achieve those positive outcomes is my job. Um, and in trying to both play the, responsible guy for what we already have versus what we're changing to is an ongoing task. You know, we're always changing. There's never a day where this stops moving and all of our partners and the people we work with are always evolving as well. So trying to keep that all in the frame of thought and being responsible for how it continuously provides a stable platform for our clients is also my job in the in the day to day. You know, that's what that's what I start the day with on that first cup of coffee is like, okay, what am I going to learn about today? What do we still need to fix today? And what are we, you know, looking to change and not break anything today? Uh, and who do I need to put a hand on a shoulder to get that done? Uh, that's the outlook that I carry into the job. Appreciate that answer. And we had another one around another one of your favorite topics, data management. Obviously, it's becoming a bigger and bigger challenge, but what are the trends here and what's the breaking point when you need to ultimately bring it all in-house? Good, good, good segue. And definitely, like I said earlier, you know, one of my, uh, you know, favorite topics. So let's talk about, you know, core data. Um, a lot of our industry provisioned data, you know, who's giving me pricing? Where am I getting my custodial information? What am I doing with my compliance reporting? You know, a lot of our data is poor. Uh, and we tolerate it because it's so transactional. You know, we'll fix that tomorrow. It only has to be fixed within three days due to the regulatory demands, whatever. We have, you know, little gaps in delivery that we tolerate a lot of poor information. 
But when you're talking about new technology, a lot of this is highly integrated and real time. You know, you can't log into two different places and see two different numbers. That's not acceptable. You know, and if I'm the high net worth guy calling my advisor, like, you know, hey, we did a big trade yesterday. Why can't I see it somewhere? You know, why is that not settling in a way that I feel confident you've managed my assets correctly? You know, there's real exposure here. So data, in my mind, becomes a challenge of what are those systems and those limitations that need to be fixed? Well, the custodians are after it right now. All of our partners and many of the others that are out there are trying to evolve out of their legacy mainframe type thinking. Even though we have cool technology on their front end and all of the desktop solutions they offer, I think the dirty little secret is there's still some mainframe based system that's doing batch in the back office. And there's nothing wrong with that. Those systems work really well for decades, but they don't respond to today's demands and their ability to change their model of data. People had to do evolving things to that data to be able to get it to work right. They've extended methods of, you know, rep code splits and being able to do different methods of householding and everyone did it in a different way. Well, when they dump that flat file on my doorstep, it's like, okay, you know, this guy did it this way and the other one did it some other way. And now I've got to bear the burden of assembling that on their behalf. That is a limitation and a challenge that all of us share in this market. So what's getting done? Almost all of the custodians are rewriting those backend systems. The chase is on right now about how fast they can move massive amounts of infrastructure and committed processing to new methods of data management. You see this with all of our partners. You see it with some of the technology players that are servicing them. And you will probably see that be the big icon of change. What are they moving to? cloud-based streaming data sources, things like Snowflake and other methods of cloud accessible information for partners such as ourselves to interact with that. What's the delivery demand? They're trying to do things in a T0 type model. You know, how do I get a change today to permeate all of my ecosystem to say Nick Graham's address changed? Just change it everywhere. You know, it shouldn't require overnight batch. It should be immediate. It should go everywhere as an event of awareness. So you will see a lot of publisher subscriber type systems be technologies that are touted and adopted or leveraged to be able to say, I've given an approved event and all of the integrated parties are now know about it. And it's now been affected that I have a new phone number, my address changed, or my assets have moved, you know, and that's where you see some of the other esoteric technologies come in, but these are all new whole cloth changes to backend and infrastructure related data systems. And the benefit of those now moving to new technologies is you can do analytics with them. You can apply them to AI. They become more available to you to do cross-checking and balances of, of you know, reconstruction of, of history and things of that nature that you could not have done with the legacy system. So I'm excited because it's enriched data, newly groomed and available in models that allow me to manage it better. And if the, the fidelity of it in terms of it being almost transactional in nature, you know, intraday in nature, then we get much more exciting outcomes about what the financial advisor can interact with. Well, like you said, you're only as good as your worst piece of data. So yes, true. A, lot, a lot of wood to be chopped there. But like you said, a lot of improvements coming down the road. So I appreciate you being put in the hot seat and being put on the spot and your insightful <laughs> answers here, Dick, but we have come to our final and what might be my favorite segment that I call stack it or whack it. So <laughs> indulge me here a little bit. I'm going sure. to throw out a few technologies and be warned. They are not always wealth tech related. And you tell me <laughs> if they are worth the hype or not. So, you know, stack it, AKA use it or whack it, AKA lose it. So the first one I want to start with is, is click the Cambridge advisor work. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to buy the Cambridge workstation. <laughs> That's obviously a stack folks, but I do want to ask about uh, robos in particular. Can we say the robo advisors are dead and the humans have won? Stack it or whack it. <laughs> I still think there's a, a stack, you know, component to this. I mean, we didn't jump all in on, uh, throwing everything into an automated, you know, delivery of service, we always took the position that we wanted to have a human involved, you know, but our, our demographics changing, you know, people want to just be able to open that account at two o'clock in the morning. You know, they want to be able to do the basic data capture. That doesn't mean an advisor doesn't get engaged. You know, you just change the model for how the automation occurs. 
you know, gather the basic data, have the phone call from an, an advisor in the morning, you know, have, you know, a digital, you know, opportunity for them to engage in confirming what you're looking to attempt to, you know, start or change. Uh, that's where I think that particular industry and some of the early solutions that, you know, jumped out ahead and have since probably come to the wayside, I think they will evolve to including that augmentation and hybrid relationship of a human being involved with the new methods of data collection and access. You know, so I, I, I don't think you just, we're never going to invest in that again. You know, digitization, a paperless approach, uh, a, a method of being able to have uh, the lack of, of physical paper and wet signatures is the way this industry is going to go. And that means you're going to have automation. You will have rule enforcement. You will have policy management. And all of that can be done in a digital way. And then you stick an advisor in there and say, do this at this time, do these for these reasons, and have some guidance and logic around the investment strategies and controls. Now you have a good relationship that starts off in a digital space. And that's what that was always intended to offer. But they went too fast with the idea, in my opinion, of you don't need humans involved. And I think that's always going to be the ultimate reality, at least currently, that there's too much judgment, advice, and insight that's needed for that to be effective and managed well, to, to have you know one or the other. I think you need both. I would have to agree there. All <laughs> right. So we'll, we'll stack the robos for now. Uh, and number two, I know we've talked a lot about it in this episode, but big data, obviously, I want your opinion on stack it or whack it on its current state in our industry <laughs> and how we manage it. <laughs> uh, that's a whack it in my mind. We have a lot of historical data that's just bad and ill-formed. Um, there's a lot of dependency on those archives that are you know, not managed well and never were built with the idea that they would be integrated across some of the systems that are now clamoring for access to it. Um, doing it new uh, there's a reason why a lot of the big players that I talked about a moment ago are, you know, basically walking away from legacy infrastructure and just building it from scratch. There's too, too many issues and it's too hard to contemplate evolving it. So they're building something whole cloth and new. And I think that's going to be something you'll see more of in the industry. And that's why I would say whack it, you know, some of it, you know, do I really need to be able to talk to an AS400, you know, uh, database and go dig around in flat files that are, you know, 20 years deep? No, uh, you know, put it in a model where I can do realistic, you know, big data management, use big data tools. There's whole industries that have moved ahead of ours that have mastered this. This is not new tech. This is being done. And we just have to find a way to get our industry processing and our information management and a lot of our controls into those new systems of delivery. And then we get to play in that space too. Uh, that that's, that's where it needs to go. But maintaining and trying to still protect, you know, the, the legacy systems of the old days and old data management models and schemas, uh, that's got to be rethought. I mean, we have variations of, of challenges that you would still be surprised you have. Hey, we're running out of rep codes or we're having challenges with date fields. And, you know, and I'm like, well, that's only because there's a mainframe involved somewhere and it's not mine. <laughs> so, you know, so where I get my data and who I have to work with that is causing me some heart attack moments. Uh, it, but we've overcome them and they've been great partners. And uh, I, I don't think I'm unique. I think other players are in that same, you know, category of consideration or demand. You know, we want to see all the data issues move to a more current ecosystem of technology offerings. Any of them would be better than the old, in my opinion, and all of them provide us better capabilities as we plan for the future. All right. So one stack and one whack. Love it. Um, Nick, it has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and thank you for just covering a plethora of topics today and, and going deep on data, cyber, AI. I know our listeners will find a lot of value in this conversation, but also feel free to tell folks where they can find out more about you and what you're working on at Cambridge and any other call to actions you'd like folks to know about. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we're very active as a company on social media. Uh, they do like to put me on the stage quite a bit. So if we're just talking about tech issues, 
Uh, you can certainly track us on CIR, the number two.com. That's our, our address. Uh, but Cambridge in general on the social media fronts uh, would be something you could see all of our executives and all of us share access and information around our initiatives on digitization in our industry. A lot of what we're doing around innovative approaches to technology for our industry, uh, even on the compliance side related to those same topics, we are very vocal. So if you're looking to follow or track, I would encourage you to find us there and begin to look at some of our opportunities to share our movements and investments uh, as things in our industry or in compliance spaces occur. All right. Well, appreciate the information and be sure to like and subscribe to the Wellstack podcast on all major podcasting platforms and follow all things Wellstack on wealthmanagement.com, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And if you want the in-person Wellstack experience, join me May 13th through 16th at the Diplomat in Hollywood, Florida for Wealth Management Edge. And thank you all for tuning in. Trade PMR offers to support the growth that RAAs deserve. Whether you're looking to add an additional custodial services provider or make the switch to a new one, Trade PMR offers advisors access to dedicated team members. So when you need help, you know exactly who to call. Trade PMR, member of FINRA and SIPC.